what I've done for this presentation is I've combined Fauvism and Expressionism. They uh, really go hand in hand, and so I just kind of merged them together into one presentation. So starting with Fauvism, um, Fauvism began around uh, the early uh, 1900s and was a very, very short little transitional period in art. Um, we're definitely talking, uh, you know, as we move into this concept of modern art, we're talking about these avant-garde styles. So I told you, you're going to hear that term a lot. Remember, avant-garde is this, this push, this trend to make art for the sake of making art, to explore a new you know, dimensions and philosophies about making art and just for the sake of expanding kind of the boundaries of, you know, what, what art can be and, um, you know, how we define art. So this is another avant-garde movement. Um, one of the first um, paintings in this kind of small little Fauvism um time period was first seen in public in Paris in 1905 um, at the Salon de um, Automne and the seasons um, at the season's major public art event. And so this was kind of like the reveal of this um, newer style. And remember that, you know, we are working with um, small periods of time and constant growth and transition. So you will have artists that span multiple movements. Um, you will have artists that maybe kind of started in the Impressionist movement and then morphed into post-Impressionism and then kind of joined the Fauvism movement and then, you know, maybe even continued onward into Expressionism. So um, you have, you know, these, these, again, these, you know, slow, kind of morphing and, and growth of art. And um, you're going to have artists that kind of have their hands in, you know, multiple movements. Um, Fauvism is known for their brilliant, intense color. And I think the next point is what's most important about Fauvism, where color became very, very arbitrary. Now, we kind of saw that with um, our um, symbolism art piece, The Scream. Technically, The Scream, um, you know, it's debatable. It's debatable that it was part of the symbolist movement. It's debatable that it was part of the expressionist movement. Because, what again, what you have here is an artist that dabbled in all these movements, an artist that, that you know, grew his artwork and, and followed, you know, different groups and um, of artists and, and movements of artists. And so it kind of depends upon, you know, the artwork, um, the time of the artwork that was um, created by the artist, you know. So uh, for Max Ernst, for example, his earlier works um, were definitely part of that symbolist movement, but then his later works were actually more the style of, you know, the expressionist movement. Um, so it can get really, really tricky. But um, the point is that the Fauves were definitely dedicated to arbitrary color. And what that means is not necessarily just using bolder color, but actually um, substituting, you know, uh, real color or optical color for, you know, an exact opposite color palette. So, for example, you know, painting a horse blue or, you know, painting a portrait of a woman with, you know, red, yellow, and green face. So colors that, that are the complete opposite of what you may see, you know, realistically, and not only, you know, what you see realistically, but just, you know, complete impossibleness of colors. And so that's, I think, important. The Favs became extremely bold and, and, and very dedicated in that sense. Um, you're going to see brushwork 
becoming even more expressive. We've been seeing artists dabble with this and, and kind of break away. You know, the Impressionists really got us going, but they were still pretty restricted in their, you know, their studies. And we've been seeing, you know, a bolder and bolder and bolder break away from that. So this just kind of continues that trend. Um, but I think another really important characteristic of Fauvism is that the compositions are now extremely flat. Um, you're going to see complete lack of perspective um, and depth. You're going to see a complete lack of like foreground, middle ground, background, and everything is going to be like basic flat shapes that are just kind of like stacked upon each other. Um, maybe some overlapping, um, but that's it. You know, overlapping is really the only way that you're going to get any sort of like depth perspective from the fobs. Um, this is an actual photograph um, from that 1905 exhibition where um, this, you know, group of artists um, had, you know, their first kind of art Fauvist artworks on display. And like most movements, and I almost feel comfortable in saying all movements of art, in the initial display of their, you know, work, their the initial like unveiling, um, you know, it's heavily criticized. And, you know, that's because it's new. Um, it's it's bold, it's risky. Um, it has to go through a critical period. Um, and as, you know, upsetting as that can be, um, that's, that's how art grows and develops. And as a matter of fact, that's how anything grows and develops. You know, if you think about math and science and, and those core classes, um, it's through analysis that, um, you know, experiments become stronger or more valid and, um, you know, that, that's how we become more confident in our work, actually, um, is through analysis. And part of analysis is criticism. Um, and so if, if you are an artist um, and you, you know, are part of this community, this art world, um, it, criticism is, is part of it. You know, it, it's you have to accept that you have to embrace that. And um, if you cannot, then um, creating artwork and, and being inventive in your artwork is probably not something for you. Um, but this was just completely rampant during, you know, um, 19th and 20th century art because artists were growing at such um, a fast paced um, rate. And, um, you know, part of that um, criticism and analysis was just constant. But um, also through that is how we got a lot of the, um, you know, the naming of the movements. And really, if you think back to like the Gothic period, um, naming a period after its, its criticism seems to almost be the trend, right? So um, we saw that with Impressionism, uh, with Monet's um, sunset painting where a critic said, you know, this is not a painting of a sunset. This is an impression of a painting of a sunset. And that coined the term impressionism. Well, the same with Fauvism. Um, so in this exhibition, um, art critic um, Louis, uh, Louis Vosse described their show of the work with the phrase um, Donatello among the wild beasts. And that is because there was a Renaissance type sculpture that also kind of shared the exhibition space, which was, you know, this very um, traditional Renaissance style um, sculpture. And um, the critics said, you know, this, this Donatello sculpture was amongst um, these wild beasts. And so Fauvism is actually a translation for wild beasts. And so that kind of stuck. And that's how the um, group of artists uh, was, you know, kind of named for their style of painting. Um, like we talked about before, all of these later Europe movements were really um, started very, very small. 
and local and it was just a small group of artists like the ones you see in the photo here um, and then once they kind of paved the way or invented this new style then it would start to grow and it would pick up across europe and um, also you know into the u.s so it started as a very very small core and then it would just kind of grow and expand So I want to talk with you about um, Andre Durain, who is actually not in our image set for Fauvism. Uh, we actually only have one image to represent the Fauvism movement, and um, it's by Henri Matisse. Uh, but I really felt that in order to understand the Fauves and to see some of the progression of artistic growth, um, we just we just need to look at some multiple artworks, even though they're not part of our image set. Um, and I needed to include Andre Durain because um, he really is kind of the founding father of the Fauvism movement, both him and Henri Matisse. Um, so I'm starting here with him. Um, he uh, was uh, born in 1880 and lived till 1954. These are just some examples of his um, paintings. So you can see here that we have, you know, a couple portraits, a couple landscapes. And um, like I said before, the characteristics, number one, of um, the arbitrary color, okay? Great examples in this portrait. We have red, yellow, orange, blue, and green in the face. So uh, nothing at all is representational of reality. Um, it's substituting um, colors that are the complete opposite, completely unrealistic. They're not even um, symbolic of anything except just the freedom to use arbitrary color and maybe the mood or the emotion of the artist at the time, okay? Um, we also see down here uh, in this landscape another use of arbitrary color, um, a limited color palette where we have a lot of blues and oranges and greens, um, but again, the use of them are just, you know, very unnaturalistic. Um, we can see here that um, you have artists, you know, that are growing and um, they kind of span through multiple movements. So you can see in this top painting uh, where he's kind of working with that impressionist and post-impressionist specifically movement. You can see that he's um, working those very choppy brush strokes like we see from Vincent van Gogh. You can see how he is starting, you know, really kind of incorporating those um, unnaturalistic colors. Um, we're seeing some things in the background here are getting a little bit flatter, you know, in terms of that flat shape um, and the composition is, is getting flatter. We can still see a foreground, you know, middle ground and a background. So we can still get the feeling of depth, depth in this one. Um, this one down here, we have perspective. Um, so how, you know, it's larger in the front and then smaller in the back. So we're able to, um, you know, definitely have some depth perspective in this one. But you can see how it's growing and morphing. I feel that um, some of the quotes from the artists during these movements are is just the best insight. You know, the artists say it in themselves. This is what they're feeling and investigating and their art is following suit. So we can get as analytical and as critical as we want to as viewers, but really the artists describe their motivation best. And I think that these two quotes from Andre Durain um, really help um, bring it home as to what the Favs were trying to capture. Um, so the first one is the visible world is a great deal less interesting than the world reimagined through color. And I think that that um, is a really, really great quote. And I think it also allows you to see just that shift from Impressionism um, because Impressionism was also extremely um, concerned about color 
um, but more naturalistically, right? You know, what does nature do to color? What does sunlight do to color? What does morning, noon, and night do to color? And how can I capture that with paint? How can I capture it boldly with paint, right? That, that was the obsession of the Impressionists, where now the Fauves, if we look at this transition, are like, hey, we're still also really concerned about color. We're also obsessed about color. But you know what? We don't want to match the visible world anymore. It's boring. We want to use our imagination. And that's that's the leap. That's the um, morphing that's happening here. I think the other uh, great quote by Durain is, we were intoxicated with color, with the sun that makes color live. Um, so again, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, comparison to those impressionists who really kind of paved the way for this, these modern art movements. Um, but again, there's similarities, you know, they're super obsessed with color, um, but just in a different focus and in a different way. Um, these are also three more uh, examples of Andre Durain's paintings, a couple landscapes, and then a portrait here. And this portrait, I think, is important because this is a portrait of his um, colleague and his friend and his buddy, um, uh, Henri Matisse. And so they were the two real, you know, founders of the Fauves. And um, Matisse is actually who we'll be looking at for our image. So let's go ahead and move on to Henri Matisse. Um, he was born in 1869, also lived to 1954. These are some of his paintings. Um, this is an actual photograph of Matisse later in his life. Um, and then up here are two self-portraits that he himself have painted. And again, you know, you can see a lot of influence from the other movements. Uh, you know, you saw how short the Fauvism movement was. So it's not that they were only um, artists during that short movement. So, of course, they had to, um, you know, come from different movements and then move into other movements during their lifetime. Um, but you can see a lot of that post-Impressionist um, influence right here. It looks a lot like um, Vincent van Gogh's self-portraits. Vincent van Gogh did lots of self-portraits and you can see um, major similarities there. So here are three um, of Matisse's wonderful um, paintings. You can see that um, the flatness is, you know, very obvious. So that flat composition that I tried to explain to you, I feel is just so obvious in these paintings. Um, it looks like everything is is level, okay? Everything is on the same picture plane. Like we know, okay, we can understand, our brains can process and understand that this is a room and this is a window and this is the view outside the window. And because we can recognize that, our brain goes ahead and interprets some depth perspective there for us. But ultimately, if you try to remove that interpretation, that natural interpretation, and you just look at what you see here, everything is very flat. The wall and this little tiny line that distinguishes the table from the wall, I mean, it's so subtle. They're really just completely flat. Even the chair, the perspective of the chair, is completely flattened. Um, you don't have any shading, shading or modeling, or um, you don't have any, you know, chiaroscuro effects. Um, you just have really um, flat shape and bold line that outlines the shapes, and that's all. Um, you have very little perspective as well. The same with this painting over here. Um, we know that we have, you know, a seated figure. Um, you know, next to a vase with some fruit on a tray. We know that, you know, these are the walls or the curtains behind her. This could possibly be a couch or a pillow behind her. Like we can interpret, but again, we're interpreting these very, very flat shapes and we're giving them a sense of understanding. It's not because Matisse really did it for us. Um, and then this is a great um, example of that arbitrary color. 
So the other thing I want to point out is influence from other movements. Okay. We know that these artists had to grow with the movements, had to dabble in other movements in order to kind of veer off and, and establish their own movement. So when I look at Henri Matisse, um, and I look at the amount of artwork that he has painted, one thing he is known for is that kind of um, pattern that the repetition of shapes, the patterns, the wallpapers, the textiles, the fabrics. Okay. And when we, when we notice that, what does that remind us of? It reminds us a lot of that Art Nouveau movement that bringing the, the crafts um, and merging it with that fine art. So yes, the patterns of fabrics, um, the kind of craftsmanship quality of the graphic art. Um, he has definitely brought that into his artwork. And you know what, for Matisse, it's, it never went away. Even as his artwork continued to morph and change and grow and actually become more abstract, become more non-objective, um, he really never lost that quality of patterns and rhythm and that little bit of like, you know, Art Nouveau um, influence. So I think that that's important to recognize about um, Matisse that that's a, a piece of the past that that stuck with him and he changed it and he morphed it and he grew it, but there's still um, subtleness of it always being there. Um, this is another one of Matisse's paintings. And I uh, think that the quote from a critic is just also giving a really great insight to, um, you know, what artists went through as they experimented and tried to, um, you know, invent new ways of creating artwork. And so this portrait was um, called the nastiest smear of paint I have ever seen. And um, it was a quote from a critic that was describing this painting when it was exhibited um, in Paris for the first time. And, you know, you got to think about that. It's very taxing on artists and it's just the same as, you know, um, a, a, a ballet or a performance or an opera or a, a play is, um, you know, critiqued, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's very important. You want the critiques to be good because that's what's going to get you the support and the notoriety. Um, but at the same time, you will see very soon, uh, as we're growing rapidly here, that um, artists really started um, to push against the critics because the critics, they were still products of that, you know, academic institute of fine art. And they were still products of that. And the more and the more that the artists are um, experimenting and developing the more pushback that they give to critics um, and the more that they reject, right, this kind of academic um, art form. So, you know, it's difficult at first to not be accepted, but then it actually winds up empowering artists and movements in the future. And you'll be able to see that develop. This is a quote by Henri Matisse. Um, Color was not given to us in order that we should imitate nature. It was given to us so we can express our own emotions. And again, I think the artists explain it best. They know what they were focusing on. They know what they were trying to do. They are aware that they were rejecting, you know, impressionist movements. Um, they were aware that they were trying to strive for new inventions and new things. And so, um, like I said, they definitely explain their motivation best. So this is the image that we have for the Fauvism movement. Again, I wish sometimes I um, was in charge of the world, right? Because this is just really not the, the image I would pick 
to represent the Favis movement. But nonetheless, this is what we have. And uh, it is image 131. It is titled The Goldfish. It is by Henri Matisse. It is from 1912. And it is an oil on canvas painting. The function of this art is really just to uh, evoke an emotional response. It's for viewing. It is for the artist to express himself. Um, and it is also this one piece in particular, this specific piece is supposed to be um, a contemplative piece that invokes um, relaxation in the viewer. And we'll, we'll get to that. Um, in terms of content, what you have here is a still life painting. Um, still life painting remembers kind of a an organized um, grouping of objects that the artist, you know, captures and drawing or painting. Um, and the subject matter is a bowl of goldfish. We have some plants. Um, it's setting on a small table. Uh, we have the wall behind it, and to the left we have kind of like a stale, a stair railing, okay? We do have some violent contrasts of color. Um, the painting is also um, applied very differently than what we have seen in the past. So in terms of uh, form and content, I think that this is a really important feature. In the past, we were seeing heavy, heavy, heavy layers of paint and loads of paint for each brush stroke. So from impressionist to um, post-impressionism to symbolism, you see that really heavy brush stroke that's called impasto, where the brush stroke is so thick, like, you know, Vincent van Gogh, for example, and, and Paul Gauguin, um, that it, it's like a raised textural surface. This is the exact opposite. It's, it's almost that he ha almost had like watered down paints um, that he painted so thinly that you could see bits of the naked canvas, you know, behind it. Um, so we have very, very thin layers of paint, um, but we still have a really energetic brushwork. So contextually, um, we have just uh, artwork here that stressed a painterly surface with very broad, flat areas of violently contrasting color. Um, what we have here is just a continuation of the um, kind of uh, development of Fauvism. Uh, again, this painting's from 1912, so it's, you know, the tail end of, of this movement. It's already starting to kind of morph um, into something else, but we just have that, that investigation, that you know, continuing what the Favs uh, are paving, you know, for the next artists. We're trying to maximize expressive effects by suppressing color harmonies. Color harmonies are these kind of groupings that come from um, analyzing the color wheel, okay? Favs were not interested in that. They didn't want that kind of natural harmony that came with groupings of the color wheel. They just they just wanted to pick color for the sake of picking color. That's the whole avant-garde mentality, okay? Um, they also wanted to explore the expressive potential of color and then it's how it relates to form. So, um, you know, again, picking those arbitrary colors, uh, um, assigning colors to a form that isn't naturalistic, and then seeing how you know they relate to each other. Um, colors are more about emotions, not reality. Um, like I said before, um, Matisse was famous for his decorative style, his expressive forms and bold use of color. So that decorative style we talked about, maybe that Art Nouveau influence, I think you can also really see it here um, in, his, in this painting. Um, just kind of working with those patterns, those repetition of shapes, those use of um, repeated lines, um, it really still gives it that Art Nouveau type of feel. Um, basically, contextually, this is, you know, the movement of making art, but not necessarily imitating nature. 
Um, so the other thing that's happening here is, um, you know, artists kind of go through these phases and of, of these focus periods. Um, and that's absolutely natural. They call that kind of like a concentration, you know, or when an artist puts out a series, then that is, you know, a concentration. They're, they're trying to investigate and answer a question. And you, you can't always do that just by producing one piece of art. You have to produce multiple. And one of the kind of concentrations that Matisse went through is um, finding, finding subject matters that were very um, relaxing or contemplative. Because again, you know, these artists are trying to stimulate and energize, um, you know, emotion and thought, deep thought, um, in their viewers. So a quote from Matisse was that goldfish became a symbol for a paradise lost. It's an art that could be soothing, calming, influence on the mind, something like a good armchair that provides relaxation from fatigue. So uh, Matisse was really focused on these goldfish. And if you also um, make a relationship cross-culturally, Matisse was also becoming interested in Japanese art. Hopefully you can see that there's a relationship here between this goldfish painting and maybe um, Marie Cassatt when, you know, she became very interested in um, the Japanese prints and, um, you know, her artwork kind of shifted a little bit in style. She went from, um, you know, painting to printing. Um, and was influenced by Japanese culture. Same with Matisse. Not only does this feel a little bit like a print because of its flatness, you know, that flat composition that um, Japanese uh, Yukioi prints were very famous for, but also this kind of contemplative, um, you know, serene and calming subject matter, which Japan is also very known for. And the fact that he is directly using goldfish, which is something uh, quite prominent in Japanese culture, the use of koi fish and in their, you know, natural settings of ponds and their kind of relationship with nature, uh, it's, it's very similar. And I think that um, under being able to notice that influence is, is quite um, obvious. In terms of form, we do have bold colors. We talked about that it's thinly painted, no impasto here, almost transparent paint. Strong brushstroke ex ex exists. It's very confident brushstroke. And then that extremely flat composition, lack of perspective, objects are turned into basic shapes and stacked on top of each other to imply some sort of some sort of depth. Okay, so this is going to transition us into expressionism. Um, this presentation was made by Samantha Clannon, and I'm going to narrate it for her. Um, when you look at her Google Slides, please um, take a moment to click onto this link and watch um, her video because it's a great kind of synopsis of expressionism. So just to kind of give you um, a background of how expressionism is changing um, from Fauvism, um, like most of these movements, expressionism is an avant-garde movement. Um, I think it's important for you to know that it definitely developed in Germany, all right? Um, we have been very centered on things being kind of developed in Paris. Um, we're going to see a little bit of shifting here. Um, Germany, Austria, those kind of Eastern uh, European countries are going to start to become pioneers in some of these movements. So this movement developed in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, just like the Favs, it's a reaction against Impressionism, against academic art. Um, expressionism refers to art in which the represent, representation of reality is not objective, okay, but instead distorted 
Okay, so the distortions are on purpose. Remember, um, when we see the, the distorted figures and distorted uh, landscapes, that is on purpose. It's not because they weren't skilled or trained artists, okay? But they were focused on distorted in order to express inner feelings of the artist. You know, they felt that doing things realistically and objectively, that got in the way. Okay, it got in the way of the expression of feelings. Okay, expressionist painters wanted to present the world from a subjective perspective and depict emotional experience that objects and events would arouse inside of them. Okay, um, I think contextually, um, it's very important to understand what is happening because. I, again, art mimics life. And so um, I think that it's easier to understand the movements if you know what's happening politically or, you know, in society at the time. So expressionism developed also in reaction to the industrialization and the growth of the cities. So this has been happening for a while, and we know that. And artists have been um, using art to comment on this change. So this, this is still happening, except opinions and moods and perspectives are changing. Okay. Um, the inevitably, the inevitable, the inevitable world war was broaching and the new power of capitalism and the rise of industrialization was starting to weigh greatly on the minds of men at the beginning of the century, especially in Germany. I really hope that puts it all into perspective here. This is what's happening socially and politically, and that is going to have an emotional effect on people in general, but then the artists use that emotion to express, okay? Unlike Impressionism, its goals were not to reproduce the impression suggested by the surrounding world, but to strongly impose the artist's own sensibility to the world's representation. The expressionist artists would substitute to the visual object reality their own image of this object, which they feel as an accurate representation of its real meaning. So again, they're looking deeper. They're using their emotions and this, you know, feeling of doom um, to correctly portray uh, reality. You know, they feel that what you see, what is objectively there, doesn't hold any sort of emotional reality. So their goal was to expose the emotional reality, which in their minds was the real truth, okay? So that's kind of the philosophical um, background of expressionism. And then that's also the, like I said, the social and political background. The Favs kind of helped open this door and now the expressionists, you know, are going to kind of burst through it, right? So expressionism was also a literary movement as well as an art movement. Um, it, like I said, was inspired by the Favs. The Favs, you know, originated in Paris. Now here we are in Germany. They're being inspired by the Favs and they're kind of creating their own movement now. Um, and the Expressionists had two main groups. Um, one of the groups was the Bridge Group, De Brucke, which uh, were a group of artists that were known for kind of bridging the gap between Favs and Expressionists. And then you had another group called Der Blau Reiter, which was from Munich. And they, they, they both had kind of different goals and different styles, but they are still just part of this Expressionist movement. 
The bridge was headed by Kirshner and like I said, was named because they saw themselves as a bridge from traditional to modern painting. Um, the bridge was um, all about a juxtaposition of violent color. So what that means is they were um, putting, you know, violent, bold colors purposely side by side to kind of play around with that relationship next to each other. Um, the Blau Reiter group is named after the founder's affection for horses and the color blue. So they kind of went through these phases of blue um, and were really focused on the color blue as a way to communicate and, and give emotion. Here are a couple examples of expressionist painting that's really not part of our image set. Um, you can still see the remnants of symbolism and um, post-impressionism. You know, they're still there. They're just subtly, you know, growing and becoming bolder and stronger and, um, you know, a different theory and philosophy and motivation. Okay, we have three images for expressionism. I think that this one is uh, one of the most unique and important ones. This is uh, image 132. It's called Improvisation 28. It's by Vasily Kandinsky from 1912. It is oil on canvas. Um, Vasily Kandinsky is important because he is one of our first artists who is not just considered an abstract artist, but he was one of the first who actually painted what's called non-objective art. Um, that is important to know in this um, content area. I don't think we have it on our vocabulary page, so you might need to make a special note that non-objective work is about taking artwork and removing it so far from its um, realities that they just wind up becoming uh, shapes and lines and um, you know types of um, objective um, images, nothing recognizable. And that's what's important. When you look at it, you cannot say, oh, that is a horse, that is a tree, that is a person. You might be able to say, it reminds me of a tree. I get the feeling of a landscape, but there's nothing concrete, um, nothing that is representation of a reality. He was one of the first artists to create artwork in that sense. So that's very, very important. You know, we have been looking at abstract art quite a bit. Henri Matisse was abstract art. A lot of um, post-impressionism was abstract art. Abstract means that it's starting to move away from concrete realities. You're moving away from realistic representations. And abstraction is a spectrum, right? You can abstract things a little bit, or you can abstract things a lot. But non-objective art means it's it's off the spectrum, that there are no evidence of concrete realities left. Okay, so that's very important to know about this. The other thing about Kandinsky is he was also very focused about um, art and music having a relationship. Um, he felt that sound and color were linked and that he could represent sound through non-objective paintings and with color and that we as viewers we could interpret that um, and so that's why a lot of his paintings are, are named after compositions or improvisations um, and if you look at his artwork i mean it really does you can interpret almost a melody and that's what he wanted to try to depict um, if you, you know, no sheet music at all, which I don't, but luckily I surround myself around lots of musicians. But if you know sheet music at all, you can see there is a lot of visual sim similarities. And when we talk about the elements and principles of art, we talk about rhythm. Kandinsky 
is the you know perfect example of rhythm in artwork the repetition of lines and shapes that include movement that's what rhythm is and rhythm does give a feeling of a beat of a melody of a sound and this is exactly what that is okay um, what I love about Samantha here is she didn't necessarily compare it with another artwork. She contrasted it with another artwork. And I thought that, that was a really refreshing look. Um, she contrasted it with fruits and insects. Um, and she did it because, you know, that's a still life. And the painting um, of the fruits and the insects, they uh, um, is painted exactly as they appear. Right. So total concrete realities. And Kandinsky was the exact opposite. Our next image for expressionism is number 133. It's titled Self-Portrait as a Soldier. It's by Ernst Kirschner from 1915. It's oil on canvas. And <clears throat> I think what's important about this painting is a um, couple things. You know, stylistically, here we have that kind of um, juxtaposition of color. Okay, very important. So putting really extreme opposites of color, so red, blue, and pink, um, directly side by side each other. So this is a good example of juxtaposition of color. Um, we also have those styles that um, the fauves kind of paved the way for, where we have very, very flat compositions. We have... Um, you know, figures that are kind of turned down to very, you know, flat shapes. Um, we have no depth at all happening in the composition. Um, so you can see a lot of that fauvism. Um, we do have very strong brushstroke um, and, you know, a use of expressive color. Um, but I think that what AP wants you to know more is kind of the background of this art piece and Samantha did a good job at um, kind of making sure she included that here. Um, but this is this is all about the artist express, expressing his feelings and basically the background is that, um, you know, contextually we've got the uprise of the world war. You know, this, this was weighing very heavy on people and artists um, during this time, especially in Germany. And Kirshner was uh, an unwilling volunteer. Um, he <laughs> didn't want to be drafted, um, but he didn't want to volunteer. Um, so he was kind of stuck between, you know, both situations. So he was an unwilling volunteer driver for the artillery in World War I. And um, he, it, he just couldn't cope with it. Um, it, so he was declared unfit for service. He had health problems that went along with it, but also um, a lot of kind of mental health problems. He had a mental breakdown. Um, there's a debate about, you know, whether or not he faked it to avoid service. But um, from what I've read, you know, about his um, biographies, probably not. Um, it may have been exaggerated at that time, but really he did have, you know, onset, onset of mental breakdown. Um, and so this painting um, was painted kind of as a recuperation period. And, and it was an expression of, you know, what he went through, his expression of his emotions um, is definitely painted in this nightmarish quality. Um, and what he was drawing here is a self portrait of himself with um, you know, in, in his military uniform and just a lot of symbols around him. So you can notice here um, his right hand has been cut off and that's supposed to symbolize the fact that, you know, he, he couldn't paint during this period of time. Um, and then we also have um, kind of the nude model in the background, which represents, you know, subject matter of, you know, what he used to paint. Um, but no longer could. Um, it, it was just kind of a way for him to work through that difficult time um, and to express it into a painting. Our third piece, 134, 
It's titled Memorial Sheet of Carl um, Liebknecht. This is by Kathe Kolwitz, um, a female artist. Um, it was um, completed around 1919. Um, this is a woodcut block print. So remember, this is a print. Remember those woodcuts, you know, it's a chunk of wood that's li literally carved and then you ink it and you pretty much use it like a stamp, right? Um, so this is a woodblock print. And um, what we have here again, <clears throat> as I explained contextually, it's important to understand the growth of expressionism in Germany and during, you know, um, World War One. that this is going to be a lot of subject matter of those expressionist paintings, but also the need, you know, for artists to express themselves. So here we're working with the same thing, themes of war and poverty. Um, they dominate her artwork. Um, she was um, a mother and her son had died in World War War, which of course, you know, becomes her emotional motivation for the artwork that she creates, the subject matters that she creates, and then the moods that she, you know, puts into her artwork. Um, this is a theme. Uh, this is a image of a woman that is grieving over um, uh, over Karl uh, Liebknitz, and um, he was one of the founders of the Berlin Spartacus League. Um, that became the German Communist Party. And so um, in 1919, Leip Leipnicht, um was shot to death during a communist uprising in Berlin called the Spartacus Revolt. Um, and this woodblock print is, you know, kind of capturing the loss of this um, prolific leader um, and the, you know, basically all of his followers um, and during a time of mourning. And, um, you know, this was just kind of, unfortunately, the theme that was happening uh, in Europe at this time, that human grief started to dominate um, the mood and the, um, the imagery of artwork at this time. So in terms of vocabulary, you know, we have a definition of expressionism. We talked about abstraction, um, but I do need you to make sure you've include non-objective. Um, and then we've talked about juxtaposition, um, about literally the placement of things um, close together to give you that contrasting effect. Here are the summary of points about expressionism. Um, and hopefully you were able to see the transition from Favism to Expressionism. Um, we're going to be moving into Abstract Expressionism for our next unit.